Hello, church family. This is uh, our first online service, and certainly it's different for you. It's different for us as well. But during this season, we're working uh, to provide an online service so that uh, we won't be compromising our fellowship together. That's very important to us. Feel free to always contact us uh, at our church phone. It's listed there for you on the site, as well as uh, being able to contact us by way of the internet, www.cbclosbanos.com. Uh, we will also look forward to providing by way of zoom.us uh, online Bible studies. That's uh, still yet to come, but please uh, be ready for that. But more than anything, just uh, look for our site, www.cbclosbanos.com. And on there you'll find uh, all kinds of opportunities to interact with us here. And we look forward to interacting with you. Thank you and God bless. Hello everyone. We hope that wherever you are, you are healthy and blessed. And even though that we, we cannot worship together in the physical, we pray that we can worship together in spirit. Amen. Amen. And so uh, wherever you find yourself today, please help us sing and believe that the battle belongs to the Lord. Take my doubt, your kindness. 
sins, but pulls me up. Your love is all that draws me in. I will lift my eyes to the maker of the mountains I can climb. I will lift my eyes to the calmer of the oceans raging wild. I will lift my eyes to the healer of the hurt I hold inside. I will lift my eyes, lift my eyes to you. God, my God, let mercy see the melody of
chapter 24 verses 1 through 12 but very early on Sunday morning the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance so they went in but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus as they stood there puzzled two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes the women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. The 
this is an absolutely fascinating portion of scripture that reminds us that our God uh, takes us beyond the limits of this life uh, and into the eternity that awaits all persons, whether saved or unsaved, believers or unbelievers. I'd like for, to ask you to join with me for a time of prayer, remembering especially our country, our world, as we go through this uh, difficult uh, time with all kinds of restraints with regards to our uh, public meetings and so on. Uh, this is, uh, I know, awkward for many of you. It's, it's uh, very awkward for us, but uh, we're grateful to a God who sees us through uh, all things, even things as unprecedented as something like this. Uh, he sees us through, if you join with me for prayer. Lord God, we look to you out of our uh, utter and desperate needs to provide for us in ways that we didn't uh, really have any expectation to, uh, uh, to have such needs. We, we look to you to provide uh, the substance, uh, the, uh, uh, the prospects of hope, everything, Lord, uh, we're, we're dependent upon you. And yet you've given us, Lord, also a sense of confidence. We know that uh, we're your people, and so uh, you are our God. And uh, we're prepared to meet whatever challenge, lay, challenge lays ahead of us. And we pray, dear God, that you would bless Calvary Baptist Church. Be with those, Lord, in our congregation who are especially affected by this in terms of work and uh, health and so on, Lord. Uh, we ask for your uh, protection during this time and your certainly your leadership you've shown it before you continue to show it now and we look forward to what you have in store for us ahead in the name of our savior and your son jesus christ amen like a massive ocean river the straits of gibraltar run between the continents of europe and africa about 32 miles long and eight miles wide connecting the mediterranean sea with the atlantic ocean on the northern side is Spain, marked by a mountain rock called Gibraltar that's nearly equal in size by a rocky peak on the other side, on the, the side of Africa, known as Jebel Musa. Together, these two magnificent natural landmarks make for what the ancients called the Pillars of Hercules. According to Greek myth, the half-man, half-god Hercules traveled beyond the Straits of Gibraltar to what was believed to be the very edge of a very flat earth. Hercules, seeing that there was nothing but endless, an endless drop into an infinite vapor of an abyss, supposedly hung a huge mystical banner across the mountain peaks that read, No More Beyond. The banner was a warning to ancient sailors in those days that if they sailed any further west than the, beyond the straits, they'd fall right off the edge of the earth. Incredibly, this silly myth prevented exploration beyond the Atlantic Ocean for literally hundreds and really thousands of years. While we scoff at our flat earth ancestors for believing such silly myths, when you think about it, we're really no less naive considering some of the hogwash we believe these days. Myths that prevent us from seeing beyond the limits of this world and this life. Fortunately for us, there is good news. The Christian celebration of Easter flies in the face of contemporary conventional wisdom, shining a bright light of hope and truth into an otherwise pointless and perilous perception of life, death, and eternity. Last week, many of you will recall, we looked at a small portion of Luke's Gospel in chapter 23 that recounted the final hours before Jesus' death. From his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the fall of a donkey to the Last Supper with his disciples in an upper room, Jesus willingly offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Believe what you want about this life, but as for the Gospels, Jesus' earthly life was only a small part of a story that really never ends. After being betrayed by Judas Iscariot for 30 silver shekels, Jesus went off to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was to pray, but instead was arrested and dragged before the Jewish high council. The Sanhedrin passed him off to Pilate, who then passed him off to Herod, who then passed him back to Pilate. 
And then finally, on Friday, what we celebrate as Good Friday, he was crucified between two thieves. Picking up then in Luke chapter 24, we come to the Sunday following Jesus' execution, and that's the portion of scripture that Shane read for us. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the tomb stone rolled away from the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the man's men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered these words. When they came back from the tomb, they told the, these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they didn't believe the women because the words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, verse 12, got up, ran to the tomb, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. The Easter story is meaningful, not just because of its historical impact, although that would be enough, but even more for its implications upon your mortal destiny and mine. Despite the fact that this world has done just about everything to gloss over Jesus' resurrection, every Easter he literally comes up again. Try as we might, but this world just can't seem to bury someone who keeps resurrecting the souls of new converts and faithful disciples. For centuries now, proud skeptics have run around telling everyone that life is limited to this body and that there's simply no more beyond. But somehow, when it's all said and done, when the, when the mourners have gone home and the potato salad has been put away, that the corpse left behind is buried for good, along with all the mysteries of their life, death, and eternity. Meanwhile, the Easter message is good news. It's not just good news, it's great news. That there's so much more beyond this life and this world. I want to take a brief look at Luke's account of Jesus' resurrection, beginning with verses 1 through 3, where he describes the coming of the women disciples to the empty tomb. Now, we've previously e emailed you a copy of this week's bulletin and the sermon as well, so that you can follow along the sermon notes on the back, as well as the script of the sermon that you'll be provided. When the women arrived, they were expected, expecting to find a rapidly decaying and even smelly body in need of spices and heavy perfumes. But of course, Luke tells us that's not what they found. What they found was an extremely large stone, store, stone door rolled open with nothing inside the empty tomb but burial cloths. Matthew's gospel says an angel instructed the women to go and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. Here in Luke chapter 24, verse 4, we're told that two men in gleaming clothes told the women that Jesus wasn't there. Now, well, fortunately, Luke's story goes beyond the ordinary confusion and fear to challenge us to experience Jesus' story beyond the aging decline of our lowly human existence. Despite Jesus' bodily resurrection and the eyewitnesses who saw it firsthand, the story remains a mystery that only faith can solve. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The letters fear, F-E-A-R, according to motivational speaker Steve Howard, stand for future events appearing real. The reason, says Howard, that future events generate fear in us is due in large part to our perception of the future's uncertainty or what we think might or might not happen. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples feared F-E-A-R, future events appearing real, 
even though the Savior had told them, as we read in the text in verse 7, that he was going to be crucified and rise again. So it's not as though the disciples didn't have plenty of information or warning. However, their fear or future events appearing real had obscured what Jesus promised them, leaving them afraid that if the Jews didn't kill them, the Romans would. Luke's account in verses 1 through 3 gives us no hint that the women who came to the tomb that day were expecting him to be resurrected. He simply says that they came early Sunday morning with spices, presumably to prepare Jesus' lifeless body. Their courage to take on the basic needs of Jesus, considering the dangerous circumstances, to me rivals that of the courage Moses had in facing off with Pharaoh or David, facing and confronting the giant Goliath. These women were courageous in their faith. They dared to visit the tomb of the most provocative figure in human history, but despite future events appearing real, they went. When they got to the tomb, says Luke, in verses 2 and 3, they found the stone rolled away, but they didn't find the body of the Lord. Now, adding to their fear was confusion that they were staring into an empty vault, wondering what had happened. If this had been the end of the Easter story, and for most skeptics it is, it would be a strange narrative, that's for sure. After all, human bodies don't just disappear, and with all the suspicion and scandal going on at that time, surely there was some reasonable explanation for all this. It hadn't occurred to these women, despite God's signs and wonders, that Jesus was alive. It's interesting to me that today many are willing to accept the idea that a, a man named Jesus was a great prophet or moral teacher who lived 2,000 years ago and told people to be kind to one another. We can accept that. But beyond that, many are unconvinced of anything that might represent God's supernatural intervention into this world. You gotta hand it to Charles Darwin. When he gave humanity a new religion based on natural selection, he really gave us some appealing reasons to doubt just about everything in scripture. It's as if a huge mythical banner had been, uh, had been held across the gateway to our skeptical souls that says no more beyond. That if we venture past today's conventional science, we might just fall off the edge of reality and into some sort of religious abyss. But there has to be something beyond the death of a man like Jesus. Otherwise, life and what he taught is nothing but nonsense. If there's no resurrection of the dead, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 13, then not, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. Luke takes us beyond today's conventional wisdom and gives us a glimpse into what lies beyond the pillars of Darwinian death. Look at verse 4. After seeing the empty tomb, Luke says, the women were wondering about this. If I were them, I'd be wondering too. The Greek word translated wondering literally describes someone so perplexed that they can't make up their mind. Suddenly, at that moment, says Luke, two men, or angels, as we find out later in verse 23 of Luke 24, in clothes that gleamed like lightning, these men stood beside them. Although Matthew and Mark recount only one angel, Luke's inclusion of two angels in indicates that there were more than enough witnesses to confirm the story. Again, even though Jesus had told his disciples on a number of occasions that he would suffer, die, and rise again, it was still almost too difficult to believe. It would take an angelic pronouncement to convince Jesus' closest associates that he had been raised from the dead. You'd think that an empty tomb would, would have tipped them off. However, it seemed to only confuse them and make them more afraid. In verse 5, Luke says that the women, terrified by the appearance of the angels, in verse 6, then they speak up telling, the angels speak up telling them, the women, he isn't here, he has risen. Thomas Jefferson, whose name is synonymous with freedom and democracy, was also a brilliant thinker and the author of this nation's Declaration of Independence. 
Though a, de a devout student of scripture, as is reflected in the founding documents, and an admirer of Jesus' teachings, we know that for sure, Jefferson also had a serious intellectual reservation about the supernatural aspects of the New Testament, and especially Jesus' resurrection. Several years back, Congress published a special edition of Jefferson's famous New Testament in which he had cut out all the references to supernatural events. The closing words of Jefferson's heavily edited New Testament version read, there they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone to the mouth of the sepulcher and departed. As brilliant a mind as someone like Jefferson had, he couldn't see or couldn't find rather the faith to see beyond Jesus' death. Like ancient sailors afraid to sail off the side of the earth, even the most enlightened souls can be paralyzed by doubt. You see, doubt is what was stinging Eve when she gave in to the snake in the Garden of Eden. And doubt continues to sting millions to death every day. However, the Apostle Paul says that Christ's resurrection removed this thing of death. Oh, death, where is your victory? He writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? The only way to get beyond the fear and sting of death is to see Easter with eyes of faith, employing a heart courageous enough to visit the empty tomb for yourself. While I and Janet were attending seminary, we worked for a business owner who professed to be a Christian and even made uh, free, uh, that Christianity a frequent top of our, topic of our conversations, but we were really kind of struggling with whether she believed or not. Although this woman, I certainly had believed she meant well, she was considerably less than honest in all of her business affairs. Anyway, after a particularly a huge fib that exploded in both of her faces, she pulled me aside to tell me that God would forgive her and that if he didn't, that she'd sneak into heaven under my jacket. At first I thought she was kidding, but then I realized that I think she really meant it. As much as I tried to explain to her from that point on that eternal life was a, a personal matter between her and God, exclusively between her and God, my theological pleadings seemed to only land on deaf ears. The fact is a lot of folks are secretly wishing that eternal salvation, if such a thing exists, will somehow just sort of happen and work out for everyone. The thinking goes something like this, why, why would God send me to hell? I'm not all that bad. I, I went to church three times a year, gave my annual tax-deductible gifts at Christmas, and I didn't even complain about the preacher, and he was a real loser. Verses 8 through 12 record the women telling the apostles about what they'd seen and heard at the tomb. Look at verse 11. But they, that is the apostles, didn't believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Of course, this wasn't the first time that a group of men thought a group of women was speaking nonsense, nor would it be the last. But then in verse 12, Luke tells us that Peter suddenly runs off to the tomb to check things out for himself. This same Peter, who had just days before denied even knowing Jesus, even using curse words to separate himself from the Christians, sees that day exactly what the women had told him. The tomb was indeed empty. When it comes to the resurrection, every single soul must return to the, to the scene of the tomb themselves and decide if it's legitimate or not. Every single one of us, even this day. The Christian faith isn't genetically passed along like blonde hair, nor can you catch it like the Wuhan flu. It takes eyes of faith to visit the evidence in Scripture and see beyond the man-made man myths that Jesus' resurrection is all too real. It takes trust in God's word, the scriptures, to go beyond the man-made banner that warns no more beyond. Every individual must decide for him or herself if Easter is just another religious holiday or the single most significant event in the history of humankind. Whoever believes in Jesus, says John 3.18, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Our lives on this earth can be lived as though, uh, as live, it can be lived as though fear is all we know and it can literally destroy us, or we can trust that God has a plan for us beyond this world. 
John 3, 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Jesus, the world might be saved. If there's nothing more beyond this life than the God of Scripture is a cruel tormentor of helpless souls, and belief in Jesus Christ is one huge, horrible lie. If, however, there is something beyond this life that a lot of folks on this planet need to rethink their existence and set things right with their God. On August the 3rd, 1492, after years of being held captive by the ignorant fear of a flat earth, Christopher Columbus sailed, bravely sailed out of Palos, Spain, beyond the mythical pillars of Hercules. He took 98 sailors with him on three ships over the horizon and into the vast Atlantic Ocean. After two months of fierce storms, scurvy, and talk of mutiny, on October the 12th, the crew landed on San Salvador in the Bahamas, less than 200 miles from modern Miami. The myth of Hercules was replaced with Columbus' invitation to sail beyond the Gibraltar and experience a whole new world. Jesus Christ has prevailed over the gates of hell, hell and he's given us the keys of his kingdom. He's given it to the church. Today, Calvary invites you to enter into a relationship with your creator that is eternal both now and forever through the resurrected hope of his only begotten son and our savior, Jesus Christ, if you would join with me for prayer. Lord God, this is kind of strange, preaching, and uh, it just doesn't seem like the body is here. But we've done our very best, Lord, to make it seem as though we are indeed in intense fellowship. I pray that this would be a, a more intense fellowship than if we were right sitting right next to each other, that, that we would take this bit of video and use it, dear God, to make a difference in our lives. Thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for ripping apart the banner that holds people back and that anyone who sees this message can certainly look into the tomb for themselves and see that indeed it is empty and that the Savior is risen. We give you thanks in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. This message has been brought to you by Calvary Baptist Church. We want to invite anyone to call our number 826-3682. And then also you're welcome to look on our website at cbc, uh, www.cbclosbanos.com. Uh, click uh, the uh, appropriate uh, item there. We'll get back to you, uh, we'll call you, we'll get hold of you uh, and provide you with the information that you may need in order to really get your life going in the right direction. Not just your life, your eternal life. It begins the moment uh, you receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And to uh, all the many people in Calvary who know Christ as Savior, God bless you, man. You're, uh, we're, a, we're a very fortunate bunch that the covenant lives on in, in our lives and uh, continues to be uh, the rest that we need uh, in times of uh, difficulty and struggle and strain. God bless you. And... Uh, and we'll uh, I bid you farewell. But let me take a minute here uh, to address the current situation that we face uh, regarding the coronavirus that's still uh, disrupting our regular schedule. In accordance with the local and national government, uh, as you can tell, Calvary is suspending our regular weekly services, but this is only briefly. As soon as possible, uh, as, as, as soon as practical, we will resume our regularly scheduled worship and Bible study programs. I want you to please be uh, patient and support your church in prayer and your offerings during this unprecedented time of public fear. Please pray for our Lord to intervene for those families who have lost loved ones uh, and for those who are sick from this deadly virus. Please hold up in prayer those among Calvary's members who are suffering themselves at this time and pray that our, our God will intervene to allow his people to return to our houses of worship, houses of prayer, just as soon as possible. But in the meantime, pray and consider giving by way of postal mail through your local bank or online, cbclosbanos.com. Calvary has partnered with Tithely, 
uh, which is an online giving service to provide online giving through a secure website. Your giving will be recorded as it is, tax deductible. Uh, we thank you sincerely for supporting your church family through this unique time. And please note that all giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering must be mailed directly to the church that we can then send it along uh, to the uh, Home Mission Board, or you can go directly to www.annyarmstrong.com. Uh, and also, if you're in need of envelopes or uh, further information, if you're having trouble getting on our site or you're having trouble uh, uh, giving online through Tithely or whatever, uh, please don't hesitate to call me. Uh, I'll give you my, my personal number is 209-675-2325, but also the church number, 826-3682. Again, we thank you so much for your patience and for t participating in this rather peculiar service. Never happened before. Our founders of our church could have never foreseen this, but we give thanks to God that we've, we've been able to, uh, to pull this off in so short a period of time. We give thanks to God, and we're also grateful for all those behind the scenes that uh, go nameless at this point, but, uh, but God knows who they are, and he, he knows what they're doing, and uh, we're grateful for them. Good day, and God bless.